tonight and present uh, a message not only on the Constitution but uh, also for the Christian, for, the, for those of us who are believers. Um, it's important for us to be involved and I believe that the Bible teaches that we are to be good stewards of whatever God has given us and that certainly includes our great country. So uh, again, thank you for being here tonight. I'm just going to open in prayer, then we're going to have the Pledge of Allegiance, and uh, we'll go from there. Father, we thank you tonight for your presence here. We thank you for bringing Jake, Lord, uh, here to us tonight, and we believe that we are here for a reason, and you are going to speak through him and teach us things that we need to know. We ask your blessing and anointing upon him and upon this whole time that we have together. Thank you again for bringing people together with, uh, with a love for our country and a love for you. And we just pray that everyone would be uh, blessed by being together tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So before we all stand for the pledge, I'd like all of you who are veterans, if you would please stand so we could recognize you tonight. If you're a veteran, would you please stand? Thank you. God bless you so much. Thank you for your service. Kyle is coming to lead us in the pledge. Kyle, right? Carl. 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 Sorry, Carl. And then we have some special music after that. Please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, can you hear me? Thank you, young people. That was great. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, it's, it's great to see so many people here tonight. Thanks for coming out. And uh, thank you, a big thank you to um, Calvary Assembly of God for having this tonight and, and Pastor Rick. So, been really helpful. Um, yeah, thank you. 
So my name's Alan Gall. Um, my family and I know uh, a few families that come to this church. Uh, sorry, that's better. Uh, we have been greatly moved by uh, Institute on the Constitution, IOTC, and the uh, the curriculum, the the mission behind it, etc. And so, just wanted to have Jake out and and share that with you as well. So, wanted to give just a little bit of background. Um, we, like many of you, found ourselves mid last year with our lives upside down to a degree um, with you know, the virus, understanding that, but also just the government's and church's response to it. And this all happened so quickly. And we just didn't know how to handle that. Um, we had lockdowns, as you know, masked up, governor executive orders, which in my opinion were suffocating our freedoms. And so um, it just didn't add up and we were seeing our rights taken away. Um, so, but we also learned how little we knew about our rights, where those rights come from, what could the government and businesses and workplaces force you to do and what couldn't they. Um, we've also gotten into it with churches about Romans 13 and what that really means. Does that mean that you obey the civil authorities no matter what, as some believe, um, leading us to not assemble uh, many times? And uh, that's that's... A constitutional right as well. Um, so we found and joined a constitution class. This one was in St. Paul. Midway through, we only caught the last half of it, uh, six weeks, uh, our family did, but we got so much out of it um, and were inspired and convicted to uh, host our own class then in our in our home. So five families came together. We've been meeting every week for six months, going through the materials, and even after the materials, there are all kinds of other videos and books that we can go through. It's lots of great discussion. We've also added worship and breaking bread together and just fellowship that we've all needed, so it's been such a blessing. Um, but we came away really thinking it's important to get this message out there because, you know, Others are feeling this way, and you can host something in your home potentially too. There are a lot of people that are looking for this um, this type of you know curriculum uh, and, and time together. Um, and I guess I, I also wanted to say that this is a lot simpler than you think. Um, they have a host edition, which really helped a lot. So <laughs> you don't have to spend ten hours getting ready for this. I mean you'll know more then, but um, it's really well laid out. Anybody can do this. You don't have to know the, the Constitution as an expert. Uh, frankly, uh, I've heard plenty of times that constitutional lawyers don't even know the Constitution anymore. Sad to say. I'm sure some do. Um, and you don't have to be a leader type either. This is simple. It's a turnkey solution, and it really worked well for us. A uh, couple other things I'll mention about the class. Uh, it, the principal approach is, a, is unique to IOTC. It's where the lessons are specifically designed to help think and reason from a principled foundation like the Founding Fathers did, which is important. Um, also another note is we have a lot of young people in this group that did really well. I mean, they were able to get a lot more than you would think out of this. And in conclusion, we have some really inspired young people who want to be in politics in some way. And that's important because we need Christians in all spheres, including politics. <laughs> and we even had some young people who got involved in the uh, St. Croix uh, county board health ordinance situation and trying to stop that. So, I mean, there's some activism happening, which is great to see. Um, so, such a good experience that, again, we wanted to have Jake come out, and he's doing a whole bunch of events over the, the next few days, but this is kind of a bigger one. A lot of those others are in in-home smaller events. Um, so, just a little bit about Jake. Um, he hails from North Carolina. He has a wife and four kids. He's also an ordained minister. Uh, he is president of the 
Institute on the Constitution, which is based in DC. And the website is theamericanview.com, so go check that out. Um, he travels around the country a lot. Uh, we were in contact quite a bit, and he's always somewhere new. So uh, he gets around uh, educating citizens on their God-given rights, uh, the proper role of civil government, and the church's role in politics, and the uh, protections we have in the Constitution, as well as, of course, and most importantly, preaching the gospel. Jake is uh, going to speak for 30, 40 minutes, 20, 40, something like that. And uh, tonight, we're also going to take an offering then afterwards just to support the ministry, allow him to keep traveling um, on our behalf in educating this country, which we really need. So please consider that. And then we'll have some Q&A, which hopefully will be lively. Think of those questions now, uh, because I'd love to use his time. Uh, so, so really put those together in an effort so that we, when we leave, we are more knowledgeable, uh, we are you know, purposed, we are prepared and inspired to action. So um, you know, I'd like to welcome our guest, Jake McCauley. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for turning out tonight. You could be at a lot of different places. Um, I would like to thank Pastor Rick. Thank you, Pastor Rick. Where is he? What a great pastor. Thank you for putting this on, agreeing to this. Thank you that your church is open. Thank you that we sit by each other and we love one another, as Jesus said that we're supposed to do. Thank you for that. I'm having a hard time to figure out who's a church anymore. You know what I mean? I, I could see a church here. This is, this is very apparent, so thank you uh, for that. I'd also like to thank Sarah and Alan. You guys are, have been tremendous. Thank you for coordinating this, bringing me out here. I always love to come to Minnesota. We're the better side of the river. If you all know where that's at, it's right over there. But don't go there right now. You might get hurt. I mean, the good news is we've won more Super Bowls than you have. Oh, wait. We haven't won a Super Bowl. So, but it is great to be here. I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. We're going to talk about a, a subject matter that's very near and dear to my heart. I'm going to share really quickly my story. Uh, but before we go, guys, we have a table on the outside. If you don't catch a website, we're on socials. We've got Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. We do YouTube videos pretty regularly. We're trying to teach and instruct Americans to think American. And you know, to think American is actually to think biblically. Now, I want to say this, and I want everybody to repeat this with me. The Constitution is not the Bible. Can you say that with me? The Constitution is not the Bible. It's not a substitute for the Bible. The Bible is the only inherent truth that is dependable, and it's a fixed standard. The Constitution is not. It needs to be amended, and it might be, need to be amended often, but there's a specific process that we go through, and the principles found in the Bible that underpin our Constitution are unchanging. That is why the Founding Fathers said, we hold these Thank you. So there is a fixed truth. Jesus said, continue in my word. You'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Pilate said, what is truth? So we are not following a man-made method. We are a ministry. We believe that God glorified himself through the Constitution and through the form of government that we have in America. It's a priceless gem. God gave a Hebrew republic through the children of Israel. And they practiced it imperfectly, just like we as Americans have practiced liberty imperfectly. But I think we're the closest example to true liberty that the world has seen. Would you agree with that? So I'm grateful for being born here. Um, so all of those things, you can find them at our table outside. We do have a curriculum uh, that Alan had referenced. Alan and his wife have instructed their children. I was so impressed that these children knew the words to the Star Spangled Banner. And y'all were way too loud. I wanted to hear them, not you. <laughs> Um, but I'm so glad you knew the words. I did not. As a young person growing up uh, down in southern Minnesota, um, I was very good in athletics and academics. Fast forward, I went to a, a government school. I went to a public school, and I started getting in a lot of trouble. 
Uh, I got involved in a lot of bad things. Sex, drugs, and partying became my motto in 10th grade. I was playing varsity sports. I was on the A honor roll. I was ready to play college ball and so on. But I completely trashed my life. How many know when you serve yourself, it doesn't lead very many good places? And so I did that. I was kicked out of school as a senior in high school. I was on my way to jail, believe it or not. I'd been through treatment multiple times. And uh, my mom said, well, there's this program called Teen Challenge. And my probation officer said, fine, you can go there until we come get you and bring you to jail. So I thought, well, that's better than going to jail right now. So I went to Teen Challenge, and I thought, I'm just going to sneak out here, and then I'm going to just run away. It'll be easy. I'll call my friend. I got a new career down in Missouri uh, waiting for me to sell drugs. It was a great plan. (laughs) And God had another plan. And I wish I had time to tell you my testimony tonight, because I get fired up about Jesus. I have read my Bible. I have prayed. That is where Christ got a hold of Jake McCauley in a very miraculous way, a very real way, a very tangible way. And tragically, our culture doesn't see the tangible Jesus anymore. And so they write Christians off and they write church off because there's no power there. And I wouldn't want to serve a dead God. Who wants to do that? I got plenty of better things to do with my life on a Wednesday night than sit in a building with a bunch of people who don't know the God that they say that they serve. Can I get an amen? But you all know the God that you serve. We know him, and that's why we celebrate him. And so this journey brought me to go into schools, for example, and share my testimony about how Jesus changed my life. Now, I was not a government student, didn't pay attention in government. And people started saying, well, you you can't be talking about this Christian stuff in these public venues. I thought, well, why not? I thought that's what you all wanted to be. It was a good Christian person that does good stuff to be one of those cheesy nerds, right? And that's me thinking because I hadn't been a Christian for very long. And they're like, oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, we want you to stop doing bad things, but you can't talk about, you know, God and stuff like that. There's a separation of what? And I said, what is that? A separation of what? What is a church in a state? I mean, I know I live in the state of Minnesota, but that's about all I know about that. And I attended a church growing up. It was very boring. And then they started saying, well, you see, in the First Amendment, I said, what is the First Amendment? I don't know what that is. Well, didn't you pay attention to government class? Pfft, what do you think? <laughs> what kid does? So as they kept telling me, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this, I was puzzled. I really was perplexed. Why would you prevent me from doing something good? What is going on in America? So I started to study the First Amendment, the Constitution, and I found out a lot of cool stuff. I found out I was actually right. Our founders of America would actually be in favor of us proclaiming the gospel and proclaiming God's sovereignty and God's law. As a matter of fact, that's what they did, and they did it in government. The Capitol was the first church in Washington, D.C., the Capitol. That's where Thomas Jefferson attended worship services when he was president and stroked that letter that said separation of church and state protecting the Danbury Baptist from the encroachment of a federal religion. He said, don't worry about that. There's a big wall. The government can't get through that. There's a wall, it's huge. Can't go through it. My Trump jokes are old. I used to have a lot of them. It's great. This is the Institute on the Constitution. Fast forward, Michael Prudka is running for president in 2004, and I meet him. I hadn't voted yet. I was an 18-year-old evangelical Christian that was on fire for Jesus, but I thought Jesus had nothing to do with government and, and politics. That's all, that's where Satan is, right? Well, that's what I thought. I had no idea. So I was, you know, the kid that you'd look at and say, that's why America's going to hell in a handbasket. Just look at him. He can't even pull up his pants, right? Then I become a Jesus person. I'm halfway there. But I'm an evangelical Christian that would have condemned the stuff that we're talking about tonight. Well, you don't talk about that stuff. Jesus doesn't care about that. Aspect of culture. Especially government, because government is his servant, right? So of course he wants government to glorify him. He's the one who created us, and he gave us government to protect his creation, his people that he loves and he endowed with certain unalienable rights. Y'all heard that before, right? So I'm learning all this stuff and I get, to cur- I get to go all over the country now. Fast forward 20 years, I pull up my pants now, it's fantastic. <laughs> Mothers love me now, it's wonderful. Uh, <laughs> um, and I currently serve, and I have the privilege of serving as the president of the Institute on the Constitution. Our senior instructor is Pastor David Whitney, our vice president. Massey Campos, he's a first-generation American, wonderful guy, does a great podcast called Self-Evident, and he speaks about these principles on a regular basis. Our dean of instructors is Ricky Pepin. She's brilliant, used to work for the FBI. Uh, She repented, so we hired her. (laughs) Guess what these are? 
Yes, thank you. That's what I'm going for. You know, I used to show a picture of my family. Nobody reacted. So now I just show my dogs, <laughs> and I get this reaction. This is Jack and Daisy, and they are American. They are American. Anytime Biden gets on the television, they just bark away. And I'm like, good dogs, good dogs. This is actually my family. My oldest son was in a confirmation class. He was, uh, thank you for the Oz. That was great. And you know what people say to me now when I travel? Okay, so you've got five kids. Where's your wife at? <laughs> Next to the good looking guy. That's where she's at. So I get to travel all over. My son was in a confirmation class. We homeschooled him. And uh, I'm really, I'm, I'm a proponent for homeschool. I believe it's important. Uh, it's our job to educate our kids, isn't it? We really can't trust the state to do that. Uh, even if the state is well-intended, and I've spoken in, in numerous public schools, I still do on a regular basis. And we've got great teachers. We have great staff. But the philosophy of public education is antithetical. It's the antithesis to what you and I believe nowadays, tragically. So even if they're good individuals in there, I see them as missionaries. But I, I don't, I strongly recommend, if you can at all possible, you know, your education of your children is in your hands. That's your authority. Homeschool if you can't. Private school. Do everything that you can, but stay plugged into their education. Well, my son answered this, uh, and he's really brilliant. He works for me now, um, and he does a lot of great stuff. He's kind of an introvert, but he's, he's just freaky. I don't even win arguments anymore, so I don't even try just because I said. And I turn around and walk away really quick before he can argue with me. Anyways, he's in like fifth grade, sixth grade. He's in a confirmation class, and he answers this uh, question very brilliantly. And, and, the, and the pastor says, well, that's very good, Dominic. And the little kid sitting next to Dominic said, Pastor, how did Dominic get so smart? He pointed to me in the back of the room. He said, you see that man back there? His wife. <laughs> anyway. We're going to move on to the Bill of Rights, but before we do that, I want everybody to open their Bible. Go to Genesis chapter 1. If you're not a student of the Bible, it's really easy. It's page 1. You're going to go to chapter 1, and you're going to go to verse 27. The reason I'm bringing you to Scripture here is because I want everything to be identifiable by God's Word. God's Word is truth. So if the Constitution gets it right, it gets it right because it's in agreement with this infallible document called the Bible. Where do we get certain concepts? Now, everybody's got their finger in page one, right? It was easy to find. Let's read on the screens up here the Fifth Amendment. What does the Fifth Amendment say? No person. So I had the opportunity to speak in a school this morning, uh, and it was a wonderful revelation for those young people because I asked them the question, how many of you believe we're born equal? And I want to ask you in this room, how many of you believe we're born equal? Give me a show of hands. We're born equal. It sounds great. It's very romantic. It's very warm and fuzzy. But actually, when you think about this critically, let's read the Declaration of Independence. What does it say up on the screen? We hold these truths to be self-evident, does it say born equal? No, it doesn't. It says created equal. And so now I get to ask the critical question. Again, this could be a public-private school. It doesn't matter. That is a founding document. That's America. So nobody can kick me out for that. I didn't even crack open my Bible yet. But this concept of being created, if you go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, I got my trusty old King James. I read a lot of versions of the Bible. Uh, I like this particular one because I think it's succinct and, and, and very to the point. Verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female, mankind, it's, it's meaning, created he them. And God blessed them. Verse 28, God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Right there we find identified in scripture, God giving man the right to life, the creator giving man the right to life. He gave it. He is the only one that can take it away. Outside of justice, which in the Fifth Amendment, if you break the law, there is capital punishment, but you've got to break the law. You can't just kill somebody. Secondly, God gave man the right to liberty. What does that liberty mean? Well, he said, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. You are liberated to do so. And then he said, take dominion and subdue the land. So what does that mean? He gave man the right to property to subdue the land as his servant, by the way, or as his representative. He didn't say trash the land. He didn't say burn all the trees and kill all the children and kill the polar bears. <laughs> but as his steward, we are to do these things. And we're Christians. We get that. Tragically, a lot of people aren't Christians, so they need firm 
parameters by which to live their lives. And guess who they look to to give those parameters? They look to government. And guess who at one time in our country government would look to? God, churches. And so, obviously, we've had a digression here in our country. Um, there's been a couple things that I want to identify. We said that we're created equal, we're not born equal. That's a revelation when I asked the kids afterwards in the classroom this morning. And I can even ask adults. Most of them are like, man, I never thought of that. I know, I never thought of that either. We're born equal, that sounds great. But then that means that we have to be born to have rights. But we don't. We're created with them. And where is a child created? I got to be careful in schools because I'm not asking how is a child created. I said, where is a child created? And they say, in the womb, Jake, in the womb. Okay, good, 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 good. So does that child in the womb have the right to life, liberty, and property? Well, I guess according to American law, they do. And I said, well, is that what's going on in America? And they say, well, no. Why do we have infanticide? Why do we kill the inconvenient unborn? Mom's rights are more important than babies. Okay. But who gave us that? Who declared that it's okay? Who did that? Government. What branch of government? Supreme Court, Judicial 1973, Roe v. Wade. And she got permission to have an abortion, which she never ended up getting an abortion. And then she later became pro-life. And she's since passed away. I had the opportunity to speak to her a couple times in an interview on the radio. Um, Norma McCorvey, she would go down to the Supreme Court on the anniversary of that, if you could call it an anniversary of that decision, and she would sit in a, with a pulpit right in front of the Supreme Court and say, man, this hurts women and it kills children. Every year, constantly. But the damage had been done. And I'll tell you why the damage had been done. A Supreme Court decision does not do anything except for, uh, uh, it, it gives, well, it says opinion on the top of the brief, first of all. But secondly, it's a decision that's applicable to the two parties in front of them. That's it. It's not legislation. Everybody say this with me. Courts cannot make law. Can't make law. They do not make law. The legislative branch does. We have a bicameral legislator. Le legislature. The first sentence in the Constitution says all legislative authority is vested in Congress. Those aren't the exact words. It says in bicameral legislature. But legislation is for the House and the Senate to determine the court's job is just to apply that legislation. Let me give you an example. Referees come out at halftime, and I know this couldn't happen, but hypothetically, <laughs> the Vikings are in the Super Bowl pounding on Tom Brady, just pounding him mercilessly. 50 to zero, okay, 50 to zip. But the, the refs come out, they come jogging out halftime, and they're like, hey, listen, guys, in the name of fairness, humanity, justice, and Tom Brady, we're going to change the rules. The refs are going to change the rules. They're going to give Minnesota only two, uh, two tries to convert to a first down, but then they're going to give Tampa or whoever Brady plays for next. Maybe he'll go to the Lions. Wouldn't that be a miracle? They're going to give him 10 downs to convert to a first down. Now, are the, stands going to sit, or are the fans in the stands going to sit back and say, well, let's get a beer and watch this. This is going to be interesting. Is that what they're going to say? Are you kidding? The game would stop. What is, well, you, no, you can't make the rules. You can't change the rules. The referee's job is to apply the rules. That's the court's job. We wouldn't tolerate referees doing it in real life, but we do tolerate the court doing it. And there's this, as a result, there's this evolutionary progression of what, what's right and what's wrong. What's the court going to say? What's the court going to say? Who's the Supreme Court nominee? Who cares? They don't determine what's right and wrong. They don't determine law. But again, in America, that is what's happening. We don't uh, tolerate it in sports, but we do in our judicial branch. Now, here's a good example. Can the Supreme Court get it wrong? Why? Because it's popular with people, and people are sinners, right? So they get it wrong. If a referee makes a bad call in a game, the media and everybody else just obliterate him for the next, like, six weeks, right? Right? But what they don't do is say, wow, did you see that bad call? Well, now we're going to have to call everything that way. <laughs> do they take that bad call and apply it to all games moving forward? No! They say that was a stupid call. And he might even lose his job. We don't change the rules to accommodate a bad call. And that's what happened in 1973 to Roe versus Wade. So we never changed the founding documents. We never passed legislation. We just said, oh, looks like the court said. Let's see how this goes. So the Declaration of Independence ensures these certain rights. Now, I have uh, with me right now, 
by the way, I wore this suit to impress you. <laughs> I'm hoping I've done that, but I'm very hot. Would you mind if I take... Thank you very much. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to run for office, uh, and I'm going to get into the details of that in a second. Hypothetically, I will never run for office. Lord, don't ever call me to run for office, please. You should run for, and I stop people. Shh, don't even speak that. A right is something you have the freedom to exercise. Would you agree with me? If, it's, if I have a right to do it, I got the freedom to exercise it, whether you like it or not, that's my right. But what are rights? Let's, let's clarify them. Do I have the right to break the law? Do I have the right to steal your sweet Mustang? Do you have a Mustang? <laughs> that I'm not a prophet. <laughs> well, let's say he did. And I said, hey, can I take it for a spin? And then I burn out out of the driveway. I say, thanks for the car! I got a right to your car. No, you don't have a right to my car. No, you don't have a right to burn down my business, throw bricks in the windows, and torch my private property. That's not a stinking right. Come on. That's called a crime. It's not a right. <laughs> Freedom is found inside of the law. If you go outside of the law, you become a what? criminal. An outlaw. You ever heard that term? That's what an outlaw is. He's outside of the law. Now the law persecutes him. You know, then the bad boys, they're going to come for you. Remember that show? That show? I never saw that. I'm way too young to have ever seen that show. <laughs> if it's against the law, well, whose law, Jake? We got a lot of different laws and things like that. Well, if you're asking me whose law according to the American view of law and government, then it says in the Declaration of Independence, the source of law. That source of law and this is a legal term, the law of nature and nature's God. This is actually a clearly defined legal term. William Blackstone, if you haven't read him, he expounded on this concept at length, and he was the foremost authority of our founding fathers. Most court cases were settled by a quote from William Blackstone. This law of nature and nature's God is really simple. Natural law can be deduced through reason and intellect. I know that 10 times out of 10, if I throw this uh, hymn book to you. I'm just kidding. I'm totally kidding. If I throw this, it's going to fall. It's going to fall. This is gravity. It's just a simple concept. It's a natural law. There's a lot of natural laws that we don't need to find in the Bible, but they exist. And they're fixed. They're immutable. On the ninth time when I throw this Bible, it's not going to hover in the air, okay? Then there is nature's God. What is that? That is the revealed law. That is what we know as, and hopefully most of you are holding one, uh, that's the Bible. This is nature's God. This is the law of nature's God. It's a revealed law. It's written. This was a presupposition all of our founding fathers knew and understand. Now, some people say, well, Jake, if the courts can't make law, well, what if the legislature made a law that was against the law of nature and nature's God? Well, that wouldn't be law. Let me explain. For example, I am uh, wanting to run for office. Remember, we're going back to that, okay? And so I'm going to give you guys something because that seems to be what politicians do now. They want to give stuff, tragically. They don't have anything to give. They're, all they do is redistributing, right? So they're stealing from one party to give to another. That's what government has debased itself to or devolved into. But I'm going to give you the right to fly because I think flying would be cool. How many of y'all would like to fly? Like Superman, you know, fly. Perfect. All right, now, now, now don't get too intricate with me here, okay? So just roll with me. What is stopping us from flying? What, what keeps us from flying? Gravity, gravity. And gravity is a natural law, isn't it? It's a law that exists. It supersedes us. doesn't matter what we think about it. So I've got to get rid of gravity. So what I do is I start my campaign slogans. Gravity hates women. Gravity hates women. Gravity, it's very sexist. Gravity is horrible to poor women. It will never let women fly. And then I go on down the line. I pick every minority group and I say, well, gravity doesn't let them fly. Look at how hateful, bigoted, homophobic, everything. You know, I throw it all out there. And everybody starts thinking, man, you're right. Gravity's horrible. Jeez, how have we existed in America for 240 plus years with nasty gravity? We can't change this. So I convince everybody. We write up a bill. It's about this high long. We're going to pass it and then we're going to read it and figure it out, okay? You know that tactic, right? Well, let's pass it, and then we'll read it and see what's in it. <laughs> Why did I think of that? That's brilliant. So Congress, both houses, we pass it. It gets to the president. Sleepy Joe. What should I do, Kamala? 
Sign the bill, Joe. Okay, okay, don't hurt me again. <laughs> and he signs the bill. Come on, Joe would laugh at that. It was a funny joke. <laughs> he signs this thing. Yeah, Americans should have the right to fly. Doggone it, we're Americans. And then it goes to the court because some of us old closed-minded, conservative, you know, Christian people don't think we should tell children they can fly because they might actually try it and then get hurt, right? But you know that we're homophobic bigots and sexists and all that other stuff. So the court says, no, 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 we, we're evolving now. We're evolving. And Americans should have the right to fly, so boom, slam the gavel. The court has determined, in their opinion, that we should have the right to fly. Gravity is now officially illegal as of tomorrow. Will you all jump on the church <laughs> roof with me and jump off and fly? Will you do that with me? Join me around the world with all Americans. You've got to wear a mask, but you can fly. <laughs> you first. Yeah, I like that. That's a good strategy. Go ahead. Let's see Joe do it. I get knocked down, and I get up again. Have you seen that meme of Crazy Joe? <laughs> He's going up to stairs. I get knocked down, and I get up again. Joe wants to get rid of gravity, and I won't stumble up the stairs. It'll be great. You can't change God's law. You can't break God's law. That law will break you. That's why he gave it. He said, hey, you don't want to do this. It's what we do with our kids, right? And what do our kids do? Oh, yeah, watch me. Ouch, that hurt. Mom, you were right. <laughs> and that's what God did for his creation. He created law to protect us, right? He gave us the right to life, and he protected life by saying, thou shall not kill, murder. He gave uh, a child the right to have a father and a mother, and he told that father and mother, thou shall not commit he gave us the right to property, and he said, thou shall not. He gave you the right to liberty, to not be perjured in a court of law, and he said, thou shall not bear false. There we go. Protecting God-given rights. This is a biblical thing. It's all in there. It's like ragu. Yo, it's in there. And I never saw that commercial because I'm way too young to see that commercial. You don't have the right to do wrong. Let's everybody say this with me. This is the American view of law and government. Number one, there is a God. Let's say that. Number two, our rights come from him. Right. Number three, the purpose of civil government is to secure God-given rights. So for this analogy, I'm going to need a volunteer. Come on up here. <laughs> Grab all three of those swords and all three of those shields right there. This is Miss America, by the way. Miss America, you're going to call me. You just stand right here. Okay. Now, what happens... Miss America moves to America. Uh, if you've read anything about the pilgrims, I used to think, you know, they had, they, they had turkey with the Indians, you know, big belt buckles, black hats. I knew nothing about their faith. I knew nothing about the Mayflower Compact that said that they set on this journey, writing this in the first constitution of the United States, which is why we're called a Christian nation, to glorify God and advance the Christian religion. That's literally written in the Mayflower Compact, which is right by the Declaration of Independence in the National Archives Museum in Washington, D.C. It's in there. It's in there. So she comes over to glorify God, advance the Christian uh, religion. She develops a community. That community is populated with many people, many of whom are Christians and think like her. But then eventually, let's face it, we're people, and people are sinners. The only place you won't find sinners is in the church, right, Pastor? <laughs> so sinners want a piece of her life, liberty, and property. So she needs to elect somebody to protect that. She reads the Bible, the Bible, Romans 13. There's numerous passages about civic leaders. The tribe of Judah was the kings. Remember the separation of church and state? And, and, and the religious leaders were Levi. There was a little bit of a separation there. There was two different jurisdictions, if you're following me here. So she's going to get a government jurisdiction. It's the oldest magistrate. It's the sheriff. So she's going to elect a county sheriff to protect her and hers and her private property or life living property. So elect for me out here a sheriff. All right. Come on up here, Mr. Sheriff. Come on up. Let's be quick about it. Now, a sheriff is not a good sheriff unless he's able to defend her. So she delegates to him. Remember, this authority is in her first to delegate to the sheriff a sword and a shield. So go ahead and give that. Which is why we should be able to be trusted with the same thing that our law enforcement is trusted with. There's a bigger uh, discussion on this topic, uh, and we have a DVD out there. But anyhow, so the sheriff is right here. So he's going to stand right here as a wall protecting her, okay? This is Miss America. So she's chilling. She's raising her kids. She's getting rich, building her business, working her land, stuff like that. Because that's what you do in America. When you're blessed, you get rich. Oftentimes. 
When you run a business and God blesses it, what happens? Do you make less money? No, you make more. You employ more people. You're a blessing to your community. You give more. Do you get what I'm saying? This is a perpetual thing that happens with the blessing of God. Read Deuteronomy 28. Read Leviticus 26. He multiplies. And that's not if you tithe. <laughs> I'm not getting into that. Okay, secondly, what happens is all of these colonies now, we had 13 in the beginning, but they all start getting their own interests. We've got, you know, New Hampshire, we've got uh, Pennsylvania, we've got New York, and so on and so forth. So we need to defend our state because we have certain state interests So you need to elect for yourself a chief executive of your state. This will be a governor that will protect the interests of the state of Wisconsin. So go ahead and select from among everybody a governor. And by the way, we elect a governor Every time we vote, and your sheriff, you actually vote for your sheriff. These are elected positions. So go ahead and pick one. There we go. We've got Mr. Governor. All right, so now we've got a governor. So, Governor, you're going to stand in front of the sheriff. You are going to protect these counties. So, Mr. Governor, right here, if you could. Great. So here we are. She's got two two-fold wall of defense. What is government's purpose? What does it say up there? To secure our oh God. Her rights are pretty secured right now, right? On a local level and on a state level. Very secure, very good. And there's a constitution that tells these guys what they can and cannot do, okay? And that constitution was written by her and everybody else in her state. And they're the watchdogs. Okay, lastly, there's a foreign uh, threat, which there was in America. We had Britain, we had France, we had Spain. We had all sorts of foreign threats. And so we needed a chief executive officer, somebody that can defend our borders, which is why we created the office of the president, to make him the commander-in-chief on the federal level. So I need a president. Go ahead. I knew that was going to happen. Oh, wow. Okay. Very good. Come on up, Mr. Prez. Mr. Prez, I like it. You look good. You look good. So now we've got a threefold defense. Now, we practice what's called interposition on each of these levels. See, this is the vertical distribution of power. You have local, 3,000 sheriffs. You have 57 governors. Just kidding. It's only 50. 50 governors. And then up here, you have one federal government. Who has more? Right here. So this is where most of the power and authority lies, and it's closest to Miss America, at least this is how it's supposed to be. I know we flipped it on our heads, but this is the original intent. It's moving up. So the president defends the borders when the terrorist comes. I'm gonna borrow this, ma'am. <laughs> what happens? <laughs> Boom! He's gonna stick me. <laughs> Nobody invades America. They might attack America, and we squash them, and that's over with. Nobody invades America. Because tragically, what has ended up happening now in America is this branch of government gets greedy. They want more wealth. They want, you know, you know, they want to create programs. They want to affect social change. And they got all these ideas. But we don't have any money. So what do we do? <laughs> what do we do now? But what do we do before? What do we have to do? We have to... Yeah. Stimulus money. Where's that coming from? I don't know. <laughs> the money's with Miss America. So... The Fed ends up going after Miss America. But what happens when he goes? Go ahead and try to get that money. Yeah, I wouldn't mess with that guy either. He's going to try. Because there's 50 of him. It's like the Matrix. There's 50. See, the states used to stop this nonsense. They'd flip him around. They'd impeach him. They'd spank him and send him back to D.C. Yeah! How about a governor to do that? And we're relying upon... These little itty bitty blonde ladies from like South Dakota to tell the federal government where to go. Why? Why? You know, Governor Larry Hogan is a big dude and he's in Maryland, but he's just going right along with it. And here, this little blonde girl, and man, yeah. She's practicing interposition, she's protecting the people in her state's life, liberty, and property. So, next, we got the governor. The governors won't tolerate the federal corruption, so the Fed gets smart. Well, I shouldn't say smart. They get nefarious, right? They figure, well, everybody's got a price, right? Everybody's got a price. So they get 30 pieces of silver. They use a little California money, and they give it to Wisconsin. They say, let's just work a deal. Let's just take a little bit from it. It'll be okay. We're going we're gonna to increase the infrastructure and the education. Hey, how's that working out for us? Is public education getting better? We just need a little more money, and I promise it'll get better. So the state flips. Now you got 51 coming after Miss America's life, liberty, property. What happens? <laughs> this guy's ready. We've got 3,000 sheriffs. Did you know a sheriff can lock up a federal agent in his jail if that federal agent goes rogue? It's true, and it's happened. It's happened. But generally, you don't even have to lock anybody up. You just got to send them a letter. 
Just a real quick story, Sheriff Bradley Rogers, he's a friend of mine, he works with CSPOA, if any of you know Sheriff Richard Mack, he, he sued the Clintons for the Brady Bill. There's a lot to explain here, but let me tell you a cool story, because I love stories. Do you love stories? In fact, it's probably all you're going to remember that I say is my cool stories. And they're not even about me. Dang it. <laughs> Lord, I thought this was about me. So this, this Sheriff Bradley Rogers is chilling, he's in Indiana, right? And he gets a letter from one of his Amish uh, guys in his community. And this Amish guy, I don't know what his name was, maybe Jebediah. So Jebediah says, Mr. Sheriff, the, the I'm talking like an Amish person, that's horrible. But you know, they kind of have this talk. Anyways, it doesn't matter. So he calls, that's true right there. That's where they would be. They would be German. And I grew up in New Alm, so I should know that. Anyways, he says, Mr. Sheriff, the federal agents are the health department of the, you know, the ABC alphabet soup agency from the federal government is telling me I can't sell my raw milk anymore. I don't know if you guys heard about it, but in Indiana, there's a, there's a raw milk epidemic. It's, worth, it's worse than the meth epidemic. These Amish people start slanging that raw milk, and people go crazy. They're like, <laughs> raw milk, I need more. They're breaking into people's houses. Where's the raw milk? I mean, this is laughable. It's so silly. But this agent is harassing an Amish dude. Hey, you can't do. So the sheriff, Bradley Rogers, writes the federal agent a letter and says, look, what are you doing? And the guy says, well, according to this, da 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 And he said, well, that, that's not legislation. You have no authority, and you have no right and no business harassing my constituents in my county. And the guy says, oh, yes, we do. And then they fire off a letter from the attorney, blah, blah, blah. And he says, okay, well, you can come back to my county if you would like, but I have a jail cell for you if you harass them. Eventually, a little bit of tit for tat, and the guy said, hey, listen, we're dropping all the charges against the Amish milk farmer. Yeah! Yeah, you can clap for that. But we need sheriffs to do that. He didn't have to throw anybody in jail. He just had to know the law. So ignorance is happening right here. And most sheriffs flip because they're just ignorant. They don't know. They don't understand the Constitution, and that is a sad tragedy in America when we know more about what our referees should be doing during sports games than we do about what our judges and our law enforcement officials should be doing. Would you guys agree with that? So we need a strong constitutional sheriff. We have a sheriff's course, by the way. It's right out at our table. We need a strong governor here, and we are starting all 50 state. We're going to get state constitution courses. Right now we have a United States constitution course. We're going to get all 50 state constitution courses. If you want to inquire about that, inquire at our table. We've got volunteers starting these right now as we speak. And we need a strong central government, up, uh, not central government, excuse me. We need a strong federal government protecting our borders. And then we'll have life, liberty, and property, and it will be secure. Let's go ahead and give these guys a hand. Thank you very much. You can just throw them down right over there if you want. So what is it to be American? This is to be American. Everybody that swears an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution, everybody that serves in a public office that swears such an oath, swears an oath to uphold this. Let's say it together. There is a God. Our rights come from Him. The purpose of civil government is to secure our God-given rights. And you know, some people say, well, Jake, that's just some religious jargon because you're a Christian. You want everybody to know Jesus. Well, I do. But I didn't pull that uh, out of my own mind. I pulled it out of the Declaration of Independence. Let's read it together. We hold these truths. So stop right there. If we're created equal, then there is a creator God. So there is a God. Remember we said there is a God? Yeah, our founders believed it. And everybody that swears an oath to the Constitution to uphold and defend it, this is part of the organic law of the land. This is considered the preamble to the Constitution. They are declaring, I swear an oath, there is a God. Let's keep going. That they are... Let's stop right there. So where do our rights come from? Remember, it's in there. Where did it come? The creator. So there is a God. Our rights come from him. Again, this is quintessentially the American view, the philosophy of government. Okay, so then what's a government's job? Well, they wrote that down too. Pretty smart guys, huh? What did they say? That too. It goes on to say, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. We put them there. And if they're horrible, it's our fault, isn't it? That's our fault. 
you know, voter fraud and stuff like that, we get caught off on a lot of tangents. And I believe a lot of tangents are real. I believe a lot of theories actually may not be, cons you know, they may not be theories. There may be some reality to it. But by and large, we've just stinking dropped the ball, haven't we? We just really have. We're not red hot zealous for our Lord anymore. And you know, frankly, we as Americans, what we tolerate and what we've allowed in our country, we don't even deserve the government that we have, do we? We don't even protect the most defenseless in the womb. We've allowed millions upon millions of them to be genocide. That's what we've allowed. It consistently continues to happen. And governors are afraid of their political clout. That's why they won't just stand for it. Well, it'll get voted down. Who cares? Stand for the unborn. John Quincy Adams, I think, put forth 14 pieces of legislation every year, anti-slavery legislation. He got laughed out of the house because the southern states wouldn't go for it. But he just kept putting it forward. And they said, why do you keep doing this? You know you're going to fail. And Quincy said, I'm not, interesting. I'm not interested in success. I'm interested in pleasing God. So I've got to do the work and leave the results to him. Don't we need some faithful men? Can I get an amen on that? Amen. We need some faithful women that will do that. And we need them in office. It would be great. I'm going to come to this, but first I want to share with you a video. So if I could prompt that video. We do videos at Institute on the Constitution every, when we try to do them every week. They're YouTube videos. They're about three minutes long because this culture has become so stinking ADD. After three seconds, we're on to the next thing. I hope you'll stick with me for at least three minutes while we watch this video. Uh, but before we crank it up, if you could just hold for one second, I did want to let you know uh, Fauci got on TV uh, the other day and uh, he made an announcement. And here's the good news. Uh, as long as you wear two swimming suits this summer, you can pee in the pool. <laughs> All right, let's play the video. figure that sound out. While we're figuring that sound out, um, a lot of people ask me when I travel and when I, I do my speaking and stuff like that, what about the face mask laws? Those are on us. Look, I'm not going to die. I'm not going to be a martyr to wear face masks or not to wear face masks. I'm going to share a story while we figure out the sound. I coached my son's little league, 11 and 12 years old. That's the age of the students. And uh, I was told by the park and recs department, hey, you got to make sure that your kids wear masks out there. And I said, no, I don't. I signed up to coach baseball. I'm not telling them to wear anything. That's up to their parents. The parents are right over there. You go talk to them. Well, coach, you really got to make, I told you, I'm not going to do that. So we got back and forth, back and forth. In this practice, one of my kids actually did wear a mask. That's his choice. If his mom wants him to do that, she's the parent. I'm not. He wears this big old mask going for a fly ball, and it just popped him right in the mouth, busted up his tooth. It was horrible. This poor kid, he was crying. And, and I said, well, there's an example of what masks do on a baseball field. I mean, come on, we're social distance and everything. Are we good on the volume? Okay, so just fast forward here. We get to the game, and he said, well, you do know that the umpires are going to make you, uh, you know, make your students wear masks. And I said, well, we'll have to cross, well, make your players wear masks. Well, we're going to have to cross that bridge when it comes to game day. I'm still, I'm not going to do it. And, and I said, you're going to have to kick me off the field. I'm going to keep doing my practice because this has turned into nonsense. And he didn't stop the practice, of course. So he didn't want to look like a fool. So good, good news, we go to the game. We come out there. Some of the kids wear masks, some of them don't. I, again, I don't care. That's your choice. I think it's silly. My kid's not wearing one. But we go out there. I said to the umpires, look, I, I'm not going to make any of my kids uh, wear masks. I just want you to know that. And he said, uh, well, we're here to play baseball. I said, thank you. <laughs> now, let me just tell you this. These, some of these people, this is their religion. This athletic director, who was throwing the, ump the umpires under the bus, goes up to the umps and says, I need your help here, man. you got to tell these kids to wear masks. My city council's not on board with it. My mayor's not on board with it. My sheriff will not enforce it in my entire county. But this guy is saying, and he sends me an email the next day after the game. We get through the game and we won. We, we, we go through, I mean, even if we lost, it's not a big deal. It's much better to win. So we go, we go. <laughs> so, so the next day I get an email. I'm flying to Minnesota the next day, right? And I'll be back for our next game on Saturday. So I'm flying to Minnesota. I get an email in my inbox from the athletic director. 
And you know what's so funny is they come up to you and they're like, well, you know, I, I'm not sure. I don't really agree with this either, but it's just something that we have to do. Well, I found out really quickly it was something he wanted to be done, and he lied to my face. So he sends me an email and says, well, as you know, these are our safety protocols, da 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 da, da. We need you to enforce these. these. This is for the safety and well-being of our of our, of, our, uh, uh, of our players, you know, of our children, our 11 and 12 year olds. Who cares what the parents think is safe because that's what we think. So just like you make a, a catcher wear, and excuse me, I'm not trying to be crude here, but he's got to wear a nut cup. They got to do that, man, because you got to protect, you know, the future. <laughs> so he's saying with the same vigor and enforcement, I make a child wear a jock that catches. He needs to be wearing a mask too. Sorry, again, I don't mean to be crude, but this is just such nonsense. So anyways, my wife, God bless her. She doesn't always get into the activism, but when she gets tweaked, she gets bent. She's on all sorts of social medias, and we flood City Hall with emails and parents being ticked off because he's an employee of the City Hall. The mayor's office calls him. The city council members call him. He's got letters now flooding into his inbox. He called me today because he wanted to talk to me. I really need your response to my email. I ignored him. I'm traveling. I'm doing something worth my time. <laughs> so then later this afternoon on my way here, and I'm only guessing, our whole high school reversed all of the mandates, everything like that. <laughs> Amen, huh? <laughs> so praise God. This time, we didn't have to do it. But I'm, I'm going to again say I have plenty of Christian friends that have had COVID. I have plenty of Christian friends that want to wear a mask. Some of them ask me to when I'm around them. I'm not going to die on the mass kill, but there's certain principles here. And I'm telling you, the other side turns this into a religion. That's called idolatry. And that is very dangerous. So some people say, well, Jake, why don't you just win souls? Why do you talk about this? Because I see America committing idolatry. We are worshiping government. We are literally looking to them from womb to tomb. What should we do? We buy into all of it. And I'm not going to excoriate a Christian brother or sister because they wear a mask. I'm not going to do that. Jesus wouldn't do that. Some people are like, I can't, you're probably not even a Christian, you're wearing a mask. <laughs> if you want to, I don't care. But we as Christians got to be able to identify idolatry, and that's part of what I am. I'm a watchman on the wall trying to identify that idolatry and point it out so that we can have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and we can have it protected by a federal system of government. And I'm not saying that my mission at IOTC or our mission at IOTC is more important than what other people's missions are. But here we go. I just want to give you a three-minute download on what, how you can accurately articulate this mask nonsense. I tried to do it. I'm sure I'm missing some stuff, but I think you will enjoy this video. So let's go ahead and crank it up. The World Health Organization has recently confirmed that the COVID-19 PCR test is a flawed procedure. And this means all the estimates of positive cases, which you have been hearing about incessantly for more than a year, now are, at best, inconsequential, and at worst, totally meaningless. Now, you have probably been very suspect of the motives of Fauci, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and the mainstream managed media with their overbearing and desperate censorship of anyone or anything that challenged or even criticized their narrative. But now it's publicly admitted by its WHO perpetrators. But as we have said here before, constitutionally, lawfully, all this does not and never did matter. The supreme law of every state is the state constitution, and every elected official, every law enforcement officer, every judge, every civil servant, every citizen, everyone is subject to its terms. No one is exempt. No circumstance, no emergency, no pandemic provides justification for any public officer to set aside or suspend its application. But there are some in our country, like Harvard County Sheriff Jeff Gaylor and Assistant State's Attorney Logan Hayes, who think that the law applies to the rest of us, but it does not apply to them. I say this because when a law-abiding citizen named Dan Swain peaceably walked into his polling place last election day to cast his vote without wearing a mask, he was arrested by his sheriff's deputies, subsequently charged by the state's attorney, and was put on trial for disobeying a law that did not exist. In fact, during the course of the trial, the state's attorney put forth no evidence for failure to wear a face mask. This, of course, is not surprising because there exists no face mask law. 
Now, the Constitution of the state of Maryland clearly sets forth and describes a process for enactment of legislation. You can find that in Article 3. And to date, there has not been an enactment by the Maryland General Assembly requiring anyone, anywhere, at any time to wear a face mask of any kind. But that didn't seem to matter to the Harford County prosecutor, Ms. Logan Hayes, who has reportedly said that she wants to make an example of Mr. Swain. Why? Well, my speculation is that she doesn't want Mr. Swain, or me or you, to challenge the lawless tyranny of a governor who pretends, by use of an executive order, to exercise authority he doesn't have. Since only legislature can make law, any governor's face mask order is an obvious breach of his or her constitutional authority. It is not law. So Dan Swain stood trial for a crime that does not exist. What does exist, what is taking place before our eyes, is a crime against the Constitution by a lawless governor and his junior commissars in Harford County. Now, in conclusion, even if the whole pandemic was not erroneously handled and purported, the Constitution, the rule of law, is not affected by pandemics or any other emergency or circumstances. The people like Dan Swain, whose rights have been criminally violated by governors, police, health department officials, and others, have a right and a duty to seek justice. Now, as this false narrative is unraveling, this very well may start occurring all over the country. This is Jake McCauley with the Institute on the Constitution, bringing you the American View. Thank you for watching. Thank you guys, and we, we do these videos every, you know, we try to do them every week to keep up to speed on what's going on, but, you know, the, the key point here is, is whether it's a good idea or whether it's not a good idea is completely irrelevant. Uh, for example, is she a good cook, sir? She's a very good cook. What's your name? Marsha. Marsha. Let's say that I go over to Marsha's house, she invites me over for dinner after this. I mean, you can if you want to. <laughs> um, and so, she's, I'm over there for dinner, and... Uh, I'm eating some of Marsha's food. It's wonderful. But on the way in, I noticed that, you know, the carpet, the carpet is, uh, it doesn't match her drapes. And the couch is a little shabby. And, uh, you know, the paint on the walls is old. And so after dinner, I, I excuse myself. Thank you, Marsha. It was great. It was wonderful. What are we having again? We're going to... So, so anyhow, I'm sure there'll be cheese there because we're in Wisconsin, right? So, so tomorrow morning... I break into Marsha's house. I hire a carpet crew. We tear out the carpet, put in new carpet. I rip down those, uh, those uh, window treatments because nobody uses those anymore. Get modern, come on. And then I get a new couch in there. I paint the walls. And let's say for the sake of the argument, I make Marsha's house better. Is what I did legal? So see, it doesn't even matter if it's a good idea. We get convinced, wow, that sounds like a good idea. Is it lawful? That's the question. Is it in the Constitution? If it's not, then it's not lawful. Then what happens? And this is Thomas Jefferson's quote. He said, the, greatest two, the, the two greatest dangers to mankind are criminals and government. And he said, let us bind down the latter, the government, let us bind them down with the chains of the Constitution, lest they become a legalized version of the first. Legal criminals. You know, we're pretty upset about police right now. A lot of people are police. And there's a lot of bad police officers. You know why? Because police officers are sinners. And if they don't obey their conscience and they don't obey self-restraint, then guess what? They're going to do bad things. That's what they do. It's a reality. It exists. Police officers can do bad things. So it's our job as Christians to be self-governed. And if it's not written in there, you can't do it. And Romans 13 declares that government is to be God's minister. That's a responsibility. It's not a title. Just because I have a badge does not mean I can sell drugs or, or, or human traffic, right? Yeah, no, guys, I'm in the clear. I got this. I got a badge, see? No, you get double the punishment if you have a badge and you're breaking the law, right? It's no different in this piece of Scripture. This is God's ministry who bears the sword. It's not in vain because he only bears the sword against those that do evil. It's pretty simple. So we're all American here, right? Are we all American here? Yeah. We need some coffee. <laughs> Have I really been going that long? Let's be American. Let's say it together. There is a God. There is a God. Our rights come from Him. The purpose of civil government is to secure God-given rights. Thank you. Now I'm going to make an infomercial here. 
By the way, this is great. If you want to take a picture of it, there's two conflicting viewpoints in the world right now. There's only two. There's a pagan view of government, and there's a biblical view of government. And this is what we teach in our Constitution course. I encourage you to get this. You can just take our course. Just DVDs, watch 20-minute videos and 12 lectures. There's a quiz in here. After every lecture, you can test yourself. Uh, this is great. We have a homeschool curriculum. If you've got your children, they have to take civics and U.S. government, so our curriculum accommodates that. We'll send you a certificate. It's totally good. Uh, you can also teach this as a Bible study here, Rick, at the church if you want. You know, Sunday mornings, Wednesday night, men's group. That's what I'm going to uh, be going over to Alan's house. He's having people come into his home, and they're doing this as an outreach for their church. This is fantastic, and a lot of non-Christians might even come to this. But this pagan view of government says that the state is divine. Ever heard of Pharaoh Nebuchadnezzar, right? I'm God. Worship me. I have unlimited authority because God does have unlimited authority. And if your God is your government, then you can't just say, well, when our guy's in there, we like when the president writes executive orders, but we don't like when the other guy does. That's why we have to be careful of tyrannical rule from the guys that we like. Well, I really liked you got in there and got the job done. It's better now, but is it lawful? Because both sides are watching how this works and what we'll accept, what we'll tolerate. And I think that's what a lot of the mask mandates are about. But anyhow, that leads to state worship. Bow down. You know, there's this old, side, and I don't recommend this, but when I was in my BC days, there was a band called Nine Inch Nails, and Trent Reznor had this lyric, and he said, bow down before the one you serve. You're going to get what you deserve. It's true. It's true. It's true. We worship government. We worship anything but God. What it's going to do? It's going to tyrannize us. I tyrannized myself. When I made myself God, Jake McCauley was in a lot of trouble. Anytime I do that, and that's what the result of this evolutionary process is. We're all the monkeys. You know, we're stooped over. And then, and then the ruling class is upright. And this is funny. This is the political parties right down here, right? We got the Democrats saying, well, we're more of an upright monkey. You're the bent over monkey. No, we're not. You're the bent over monkey. And the ruling class is sitting there like, look at them fighting each other. That's why the gospel is essential, isn't it? Because he says, love your enemies. Who does that? I don't. Are you kidding me? Unless my heart's converted, I want to smoke my enemies. That's what I want to do. Let's be honest, right? That's our human nature. That's why we need Jesus. Some of the religious people in here are like, well, I don't think that way. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. <laughs> that man must be a sinner. I can't believe pastor let him up there. There's a biblical view of government that said that God gave government. He limited government. Remember Jesus? Give to Caesar what's Caesar's. Give to God what's God's. Because he knew, fast forward about uh, three more decades, that the Roman government would require Christians to pinch incense to Caesar. And Jesus is saying, ah, no, 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 no. That belongs to God. Caesar's not God. So he's instructing, he's limiting government jurisdiction. He's validating it on one side and he's limiting it on another. Does that make sense? It's exactly what he's doing. Well, this leads to patriotism. We love our veterans because they don't cram health care down our throat. Have the National Guard, well... It could happen, I guess. But have they showed up to your house to make sure you're wearing a mask, make sure that you don't spank your child, make sure that you get inoculated with a vaccine. They don't do that stuff. They defend our personal rights. But up there in D.C., we have major problems. We're not very patriotic. Do any of you, when it comes to tax day, say, Honey, send them an extra five grand this year. I love what they're doing. <laughs> Does anybody say that? No. How many of you volunteer and give things to veterans organizations and so on? Through, Of course we do. Why? Because we're patriotic. We love them. This is based on us being a republic where we're all under law. We're all created equal. That's where that concept comes from. Okay, so we're going to move fast forward. I want to tell you it's a little infomercial. Uh, the pastor had our veterans stand up. I mean, that is the price. That's interposition. That's what we saw up here. We've got different branches of government interposing to protect, uh, to protect Miss America. Oh, gosh, I, so many things just flood into my head when I'm talking. You guys have ever, uh, heard the song... Um, uh, Come Thou Fount. Yeah. Come Thou Fount. Uh, maybe that's it. So there's a particular lyric in there that says, Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the full of God. Guys, that's me, and this is part of my testimony. I literally, it was a very vivid time for me when Christ, Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the full of God. He to rescue me from danger, what? Interposed his precious blood. I saw that. Jesus interposing between me and the wrath of God. I deserved that wrath, because I was a bad sinner. And Jesus interposed. That's what our veterans do. This is a sacred thing. It's why uh, the founding fathers swore that oath and pledged their life, liberty, 
and, and, and their own property on their behalf. We have graduates from our curriculum all over the country. They're in all 50 states. We have chapter leaders. These are people that are dedicated to teaching the courses, helping others in their state teach the course, and multiplying um, this knowledge. We have those all over the country as well. We have, well, you actually have more. I've got to update my slideshow. Uh, we, I speak in churches and groups all over the country. I'd be happy to speak at your church if you don't uh, attend here. Uh, I, would love, I would love to send one of our speakers to come out and help you guys start a course. Whatever we can do to help, we want to do that. Obviously, uh, we reach the next generation. That's important. I was just in a school this morning. Typically, when I travel, I'll share in schools. You can get our curriculum in schools. You can teach it in schools. Um, it's very turnkey. Whoops. Sorry. There we go. Uh, homeschool conventions. There's my little patriot, Micah. This hero was George Washington. When he was young, can I tell you a cute story? He was young. We went to Mount Vernon. I didn't, I didn't even wait for you to answer that. I just, <laughs> I went into the story. So he's sitting in Mount Vernon. He's probably like five or six. He loves General Washington. General Washington is his hero. Talk about ba baseball, basketball. He doesn't know anybody there. He loves Washington. So we go there, and there's a play actor as General Washington, and he gives a little speech. He's got his military uniform on. And then, you know, the speech was over, and we're going to go get candied apples or something like that. We're like, come on, Micah. He's like, no, I want to stay here with General Washington. <laughs> so that's him. Homeschool curriculum, we have that. We have liberty camps for children. We have pastor seminars, one-day seminars for pastors and local uh, elected officials. And um, our founders run for office. We've got a lot of things. Now, how does this work? I will tell you that I independently work in sales. So I raise my own dough. I'm not here begging money for my salary. What you give does not increase my salary at all. I have private donors that have done that and have sustained us. But I'm you. I work a gig. Generally, when I travel, I'm out doing sales during the day, and I come here at night to do this. I just got done doing that in Nebraska. So I just want you to know that the resources that you sow into our ministry really legitimately do go into the country. Now, this is a calling for me. This is something that I, that, that me and the Lord, this is a calling that he's laid in my life. Not all of you are called to do what I do, okay? And I understand that. But I can promise you, if you guys tithe or if you sow seeds or you give money and the Lord has put it on your heart, I can promise you we're going we're gonna to plant that into America. And we're gonna, right now we're seeing exponential growth, but that's because there's a threat to our liberty. So more people are getting educated, and I want to take advantage of that. And we have a wonderful staff of people that are doing just that nonstop, reaching out to people and expanding that education. You can find out more about that at our table. If you become a member of Institute on the Constitution, you get all of our resources digitally. We're selling physical resources at the table. If you become a member of Institute on the Constitution, you also get a discount on all of our store items. We have cool gear. We have merch gear. Make the Constitution matter again. We've got really cool stuff. So that's all available. I'd be happy to have a discussion with you about that outside. Also, Liz, my colleague Liz is here. And I'd also like to thank uh, uh, former Representative Dan Johnston for joining me today from North Dakota. Dan, can you raise your hand for me for a second? This man is a patriot. I'm honored to work with him, serve with him. Fantastic, fantastic, patriotic guy. Homeschools, he's got a big tribe of kids. They fed me cow tongue when I went there. They tricked me, and it was good. They waited till after I liked it before they told me about it. We even caught a catfish, but I wouldn't take it off the hook because I'm kind of a sissy. So what he did is he had his, what, was she 14 at that time? He had his 14-year-old daughter take it off for me. What a man. I'm just not called to take off catfish. I'm sorry. So these are some of our products up here. You can teach or take the course with our host kit. You can just take it if you want. Uh, those are some of the other courses, and then we have different novelty items. Okay, now, I promised uh, that I would open the, the floor up for some discussion, maybe some questions. Um, if some of you have been writing them down, that's great. I'd love to take those questions, and so we can spend a little bit of time. Some of you may need to go. That's fine. Um, I would appreciate if you'd prayerfully consider making a donation We've got a table right around there. I know we're going to be passing the offering thing in a little bit. Oh, okay. Super. Alan's going to do an offering first, then we'll do Q&A. So get your questions ready. Thank you, everybody. Teachers would come. I get the privilege of uh, asking for the offering tonight. Are you enjoying yourself? Yeah. Very... Excellent presentation. I'm so glad that you came tonight. The only question I have is, what if Fauci decides that two swimsuits is not enough and now you've got to wear five? <laughs> and you've already been in my pool. 
<laughs> let's, let's, let's have a word of prayer, first of all. And Father, I just thank you for Jake. Lord, he's sacrificed to be here. He's left his family behind. And Lord, he's come to share a message with us. And Lord, I'm so grateful that he has. And ask that you would continue to bless him in his ministry and, his, and give him safe travels. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would increase and uh, make him to abound more and more. And uh, Lord, that his influence and his message would continue to spread in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. We would like to do a little surprise here and to call up the Gull family. We have a little something for you. Um, my family, yes, please, all of you, come on up, please. Um, we have been blessed along with those other four families to have been in their home while they clean their house, send out the menu, prepare the lessons, then clean up after we leave. And they have been a blessing in our lives, and I highly recommend that we get into community with other like-minded families and learn. We've been very blessed. And Jerusha has a gift, or we have a gift for the kids if they want to open it. Of course, an American football. And of course, a living plant. So um, we can enjoy it on your porch at your home that we enjoy so much. Thank you for, they have sacrificed uh, financially to bring Jake here. So we greatly appreciate your financial support to help offset the costs. And um, thank you.
Do we want to do want to? I'll just invite people to come up. So um, why don't you come up here and we can either form a line. You could sit down nearby, but somebody start us off with a question because uh, this is a great opportunity. So this one's bugs me. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah, I guess I'm open carrying. It was I was getting like you getting hot wearing my jacket. So, so let's kind of focus on interposition. So you got federal, state, county sheriff, Miss America. So what happens when the federal government and the state government? launch a marketing program to lobby Miss America and all of her friends mm -hmm. to buy into the tyranny that they're trying to sell to the point where there's 50% of them are darn near right. who are voting for this stuff. How do we counter that? Right. So obviously, since America was founded, since the Constitution was drafted, there has been an, there's been an assault against it ever since the ink dried. Uh, and so one of these things is what we call the democracy, you know, the mob rule. 51% gets what they want. Our founding fathers in Article 4, Section 4, guaranteed to each state in the union a Republican form of government. That's not the, the elephant, the big R, it's the little R. This is a, a form of government whereby government is subservient to the law. And we democratically select or elect our representatives, right? We don't democratically elect a president. We don't democratically elect a Supreme Court. We democratically elect our representatives. And our representatives can completely ignore us once they get there. They can be recalled, they can be appeased, she said they do. <laughs> Matter of fact, I think, I think that's like in the rule book. Okay, now, don't listen to anything your constituents said now that you're in office. Uh, so, his question was, is what if we devolve in our thinking to think that we are a democracy? Well, it doesn't change the Constitution. It doesn't change that we're not a democracy. But we are voting for things, and we're doing them incorrectly, I believe. So, for example, we have vote for, I'm going to use our state legislatures just as an example. Now, Dan is from North Dakota. I introduced Dan before, He's a former representative. Their legislature, their state legislature, signed into law that the governor could not issue, the, the mask mandates are not enforceable by law. Okay, so what does the governor do? He's got to sign that. Do you think he's going to sign it? No. But there's a way to override a governor's veto by two-thirds. So guess what? State legislature, two-thirds, overrode his authority to have mandates and then use the force of law to back those mandates. We are suffering now because, and I'll give you a great example, almost every school that I walk into, I ask, are we a democracy or are we a republic? What do students say? Democracy. democracy. Our last president said democracy, democracy, democracy. Once in a while, you'd get Republican there, and that was great. This president doesn't say much. <laughs> uh, the president before democracy, the president before that Bush, democracy, democracy. We're going to spread our democracy. We're going to send our armed forces over, over into the Middle East, and we're going to make them submit to democracy. I mean, it was just ludicrous. Both parties do it. I think Ronald Reagan might have been the last one to really acknowledge that we're a republic. So obviously, we have to educate, don't we? We've got to get a lot of work done. I want to encourage you with this. I wish there was a simple answer to your, to your question. So if that 50% of Miss Americas want to vote that way, they're generally population pockets where people think certain ways, right? The urban dwellers don't think the way the farmers do. That's why we have local governments, right? Which is supposed to be the, 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 the rule, not the exception to the rule. So if at any time that democratic system of thinking happens, if it happens on a federal level, that's where the state is supposed to stop it. If it happens on a state level, that's now... Tragically, your last line of defense is going to be that local level where the sheriff is. And that sheriff can walk up to an abortion clinic and lock the doors. He, he can do that. He, a sheriff can do that. So he has that authority to do that. Does he do that? No. And he'll, he'll come up with a whole bunch of reasons and excuses. Now, this is where we get to the point. John Adams, 
was a man, he was a God-fearing man, he was a Christian man. You can read his writings. He's very eloquent in his Christianity. But he said, look, I don't even fear the American people. But I fear future rewards and punishments. I fear facing my creator on a day when I've betrayed my oath that I swore to him I will uphold. So we've got to repopulate those that serve in public office. We've got to repopulate them with Christians. It's not an easy task. This is an uphill battle. We didn't get here overnight. We're not going to flip the script the other way. I was in North Dakota not too long ago, uh, and there was a gentleman. We were just, uh, I think maybe we were around Bismarck or something like that. But anyways, I was speaking there, and a guy came up to me, and he said, Jake, man, you do great things. I wish I was more like you. I wish I could do more stuff. And I said to him, well, thank you. You honor me, and I appreciate it. I'm grateful that you appreciate what our work is. I said, how many children do you have? And I think he named like four or six. You know, farmers have big families. And so I said, could you just imagine with me, I just don't want you to short sell yourself. If you raise those six kids to think American, to think Christian, you just multiplied yourself six times. All of us in this room probably have kids or grandkids, right? Could you imagine if they just all, we just tripled our army, right? So the real work isn't actually done with what I do. I probably haven't convinced any of you tonight. You were already bought in. I got to come up here and feel cool and tell jokes, which I like doing, and that's good, and I got to encourage. But you are spending the hard work day in and day out training the next generation, and that is truly how we do win this. That is truly how we win this. And the reason that we're losing is tragically so many people send their kids to institutions that are teaching them to think that their parents' way of thinking is wrong. And so then that gap continues to widen and get bigger and bigger and bigger. So our success is going to be on that front. First, we have to get over this democracy way of thinking, and we have to get back to a republic, and we have to get back to a republic based on law, and whose law is that? Is, is American law? It's, it's based on God's law. That's right, and we have to be unashamed about that. We don't have to be crazy religious people, you know, with the big Jesus belt buckle and the huge hats and the stuff like that. Now, if you're that person, that's totally cool. I'm not downing that. But I'm saying we're in a culture where we can articulate, where we can be wise as serpents and innocent as doves, the Bible says. So we can do that. We can play ball. We're God's people, man. And situations may arise in your own personal place, like me, little Jake McCauley, baseball coach in Johnston County. <laughs> My athletic director has no idea how big of a microphone I have and that he's going to be in a video next week. Um, <laughs> But God put me in that position, and I can't, I, I'm not, just, I, I just, there comes a point where you just don't roll over anymore, right? Maybe that's at your work. Maybe you might get fired. Sometimes it doesn't always turn out good. I think at the beginning of yesterday, he was calling me to relieve me of my duty of baseball coach. Dang it, I was getting paid so well, you know? <laughs> but then God turned the change of events, but sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes we suffer. Sometimes we do. So I want to encourage you, that is part of this change. We want to help connect you with people throughout the country. That's part of our network that we're creating across the country, to get people to think American. And I will promise you, I really do promise you, so many people think the way that we think. But so many people, are, they're just not bold. They just, they haven't stepped into that authority yet to actually practice what they believe. But a lot of them will follow you when you do, right? Like you go first, right? And I believe that's what God did to all the great men that we read about in this Bible. None of them volunteered for the position. Generally speaking, when you are that guy that volunteers for the position, you might not have the right motives when you're doing it. Do you get what I'm saying? God always seemed to use the guy that was like, no. I mean, Gideon wasn't exactly, you know, campaigning. <laughs> the Lord's like, Gideon, I'm going to use you. Oh, uh, no. Make that rag wet. Oh, crap. <laughs> all right, make it dry. Crap! <laughs> you know, I mean, and on and on and on and on. So anyhow, I'm sorry. I, I, hope, I, I hope I answered that question. Um, I told a lot of stories and jokes. Yeah, no, it's, it's a question. Yeah, it is a tragedy. We bought into democracy. And so then if we can give that constituency something, they'll give us their suffrage, their vote in return. Which is, a, which is a total crime to the way that America uh, was founded. How do you convince others that our founding fathers are, and our Constitution is racist? Or, are they racist? Oh, that it's because not. They've, they owned slaves right. during not all that of them, time. Yeah, yeah. Not all of them, obviously. Sure. 
Um, how do you explain that to people when you see the three fifths clause? Right. You know, you see them owning slaves. How do you how do you explain that? Got it. That's a great question. Thank you. I've got it, Mike. You can just give that right back to him. Thank you very much. Um, so it's a great question. Slavery and uh, racism. Our founding fathers were slave owners. That must mean that they were racist. Hey, you know what? Some of them might have been. Again, our founding fathers are not Jesus. Can you say that? Founding fathers are not Jesus. Uh, during the Declaration of Independence, slavery was thrust upon America by Great Britain. Okay? I'm not making excuses. That's just a fact. And slavery did not just exist in the United States of America. It existed all over the world. Always has. It's always been a scourge. As a matter of fact, there's more slaves today than there was then. So, there's that little thing. When the Founding Fathers declared independence, they were declaring that all men were created equal. Many of those founders that signed that document, like Benjamin Franklin, uh, Benjamin Rush, John Adams, these were abolitionists. That means they worked to eradicate slavery even though the British government said that that was illegal to work against that. So now we have slavery. Fast forward, okay, and we have the signing of the Constitution. We have the Three-Fifths Clause. It was part of the Great Compromise. The Three-Fifths Clause does not say that a person who is black or of African descent is only three-fifths of a human being. What it's saying is that that one person who is created in God's image. And again, I'm not going to try to justify those that owned slaves and treated them as chattel. Does that make sense? They treated them as property. People are not property. That's in the Constitution. So many of them were just hypocritical to what the documents actually said. But we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. For example, any of you have heard of Ravi Zacharias, right? Yeah. Horrible, 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 horrible person, horrible sinner horrible, inexcusable on so many levels. But did the truths he teach, should we throw those out too? No, because they're still truths. So the document may have been produced and some of these men may have been uh, you know, of the thought process that blacks were not equal to whites, but the document that was produced is good. The three-fifths clause, I'm going to fast forward. Frederick Douglass, you all know Frederick Douglass, right? He escaped slavery became a prominent writer, world traveler. Uh, he was the first African-American advisor, the first one invited into the White House, President Lincoln. Frederick Douglass was taught by the abolition societies that the Constitution is racist. Look at the three-fifths clause. Look at these clauses that said that you can't do away with racism for X amount of years. Okay, now I just want to explain those two clauses for an example. I think it was 1820, I believe, is what the Constitution says. We couldn't do away with slavery until 1820. And then we had the Three-Fifths Clause. The Three-Fifths Clause said that if, if you have a citizen in your state that is black, you only get three-fifths of a representation from that person. Now, if you want to free that person who's black, then you would get a full representation. So the North was placing the burden on the South and saying, look, if that's how you want to play ball, then you get less representatives. And the long-term strategy to this, not by all, but by many, was that eventually, within 20 years, we're going to have more representation, we're going to get rid of slavery. Didn't happen, though. Because, again, men are sinners, and they're horrible. Horrible, horrible, horrible. So Frederick Douglass said that I read the Three-Fifths Clause, and I thought the Three-Fifths Clause and the Constitution was inherently racist. But I've now found out differently. This is coming from Frederick Douglass, okay? Pretty smart guy, much smarter than I am. Remember, I didn't finish high school. This guy was, like, brilliant. So he reads into the three-fifths clause, and he said it was a downright disability on the southern states. Instead of promoting slavery, it worked against those southern states. It was saying to the southern states, if you want equal representation in the House and in the Senate, then you better free your slaves. Now I'm going to talk to you personally, for my own personal. Again, I just said men are sinners. And I can't condone slavery on any level. The institution of slavery, it's an abomination. As a matter of fact, God said, if you steal somebody, it's capital punishment, baby. You die. So we practice that imperfectly, but the document was not imperfect. I believe the Declaration of Independence is one of the most brilliant government documents written by a man who owned slaves. Unjustifiable. He did happen to be a man that owned slaves, that armed his slaves. He gave his slaves guns. 
So I'm not sure that he was mistreating them. I mean, I wouldn't give a guy a gun. Hey, I just beat you. Here's a gun. <laughs> I'm just saying, okay? It does not justify Thomas Jefferson owning slaves. I've been to Monticello, and he didn't free his slaves when he died either. A lot of them were sold for debt. So it's just horrible. It's a horrible tragedy. But that document itself has been used to liberate people. Fast forward to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Do you know the document that he quoted most often? The Bible. The next document that he quoted? Declaration of Independence. And what he said is basically, all we're saying to America is be true to what you said on paper. Look, it's stinking written there. Isn't that what we're saying right now? It is written there. Do it. You're not doing it. And many of our founders didn't do it. There was no Nikes back then. They didn't do it. But we don't throw out the Constitution as a result of the flawed men that wrote it. So that's the best answer that I can give. And I will say that America has suffered because of that institution. Sin makes you suffer. And we've suffered, and we don't we still continue to suffer? We really do. But you know who fixes the sufferings? You know who did that? It was the church. It was Christian men and women that were a part of the Underground Railroad. That said, I don't care, you can torture me, take my property, this is wrong. It was Christian men and women that came forth and put forth the 14th Amendment. It was Christian men and women that worked for the freedom and liberation and equal rights and so on and so forth. Martin Luther King Jr. was always meeting in churches. It was the church that did this work, and it's the church that needs to step up and do this work now. That's what I believe. I hope that helps answer your question. In our course, we actually have a whole section on that. Um, so we take these hot button items, and we address them in our course. So I can do, we do it a little bit more in depth in there, and, and there'll be some more helpful uh, ways to do it. But I appreciate that. Don't shy away from those questions. You got to take them head on. We need an answer. Well, I would like to know, does the Constitution give the military power to take over if they see there was a fraudulent election and or if Arizona and then subsequently the other states find fraud, what is the constitutional mechanism to make corrections? Okay, thank you. That was a good question. I have no idea. Next question. Let me just say this. Uh, my colleague, David Whitney, is much more uh, versed on the subject matter that you're discussing. And I have done some commentaries on this uh, in our archives of our YouTubes, if, if you wanted to watch that. So here's what happens. Each state determines who their electoral votes are going to go for. Uh, and that's up to the state. So the only way that I can see this happening, because constitutionally, we, we don't really discuss, well, what if there's voter fraud? That's not really written in the Constitution. We don't, like, have a litmus test for that. But if the state determines that the state should figure that out within the state. Now, if the state is fraudulently doing something, that does invite the jurisdiction of the federal government. And I think right now we have, we, we've asked judges to look at the evidence, weigh that evidence, release court orders for more evidence, and so on and so forth. But I, I would say this is my personal opinion, because I don't want to get into trouble on making an answer that's outside. There really isn't any clarity in there when it comes with voting. So what should Arizona do right now? So I know the reality of what's going on in Arizona, and I believe there probably was some nonsense. And you know why I believe that? Because people are sinners. And voting has to do with power. And guess what? The big sinners like to be around the power. So I do believe that's happening. And that could uncork a whole lot of stuff in our country. That would honestly be breathtaking, wouldn't it? Yeah. If this whole thing got folded back, this would be unprecedented. Yeah. That would be an act of God. Yep. Because, because tragically, both parties, and I really mean this, both parties are into this power grab. Both parties are into lying to the American public for their own good, of course, because they think better than we do. So if this happens, this will be miraculous. This really will be. And I would love to see that happen. And I believe it'll be, it'll be a move of God, and it'll be a move of bold men that are called by God to stand and say, no, I'm not accepting this answer. I'm going to move forward. It's going to be men and women that God has positioned 
decades ago to be in the right spot at the right time to declare the right words that he has put in them. Does that make sense? So that's where this all comes back to the sacredness of his church, of God's church. When you're submitted to God, he positions you. And you might wait. You might wait a long time. As a matter of fact, you're pretty much guaranteed you're going to have to wait quite a while. When I read through Holy Writ, there was like big chunks of periods. Lord, are you there? 20 years later. Lord, are you there? 25 years later. Oh, I got a son now. Abraham, Isaac. So anyhow, that's the importance of being the church. Yes. So would the military be brought in? Is that the question? Would they have authority? The executive branch, he's the commander in chief of the military. So here's where we've got it. So then if Biden isn't the executive, is that kind of what you're asking then? Right. Does that bounce back to then the current president? Dan, do you have an answer for that? No. <laughs> it's so unprecedented. Yeah, it's unprecedented. But if you unfold it back, we go back to the fraud. Was the fraud committed? And then is it ex post facto then? Okay, so then do we remove this and we restore that one? I would say yes, because that's what the votes dictated. And if that's what the votes dictated, then we got a real big problem. Both parties do. And I believe both parties are complicit to it, which brings me to my statement, it's going to be an act of God that does it. I'm sorry, I couldn't be more... And I, I would actually like, if you want to email me, I'll give you my email address back there. Maybe I, can, maybe I can look into this a little bit deeper and give you a little bit better explanation. Well, there is federal enforcement powers, that's correct. Right, which was an executive order. Um, and so that's where a lot of people are waiting and saying that he still is the president, stuff like that. Let me give you my answer to that really quick. So there's a lot of things that happen. There's a lot of concepts out there that exist that are actually true. I just don't choose to talk about them. And this is why. I'm not saying they're wrong and I'm not saying people shouldn't. But what I am saying, my, my mentor, Michael Pruka, who founded this organization, he said to me, Jake, never get too far ahead of your audience. And you all get that concept, right? If I go too far, I lose everybody. Man, I'm trying to get people through the door. Hey, did, did you know there's a constitution? No. <laughs> well, what if Arizona flips? Can we send the military? What? <laughs> what? I'm, I'm just playing around right now. But I've had experience in that. You, I got, I'm just, I'm, come on. Yeah, there's a constitution. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know we have a president in this country, right? Yeah, come on, keep coming. Don't look at your phone. No, stop. Let's keep talking about something relevant that matters. Yes, ma'am, you had a question. Okay. Um, just after the election, I want to make a statement, and then I want to ask my question. Sure, absolutely. But first, the, along with what we were just saying, um, right after the election, I was just having my morning time with the Lord. And he gave me something. I posted it on Facebook. Sure. But his words were, the judgment of God is coming against this country because of things that hadn't been done that needed to be done. Mm -hmm. And this, what's happening right now, and this constitutional awareness and bringing it to the people and doing something, that's repentance. And that's what judgment is for. That's it's true. for us to repent so that we move forward and do something. Because we've not. So that's my statement. I agree with that statement. That's scriptural. So the question that I have, I work in healthcare administration, okay. and I'm sure other people here do too. Mm -hmm. um, right now, I'm looking at a federal government that's basically pushing things that aren't constitutionally right. legal, mm -hmm. and then they are putting in place another agency to do the actual bidding. Right, carry it out, yeah. So we've got the CDC making rules and laws <laughs> for healthcare. Um, and I'm wondering how that gets undone. Mm -hmm. what, what can we use to stand against it? I mean, we've got mask mandates in places that they shouldn't be. We've got OSHA would cry and die mm -hmm. if they saw the way that these things are being done. We've got bags in the nursing home with masks in them that the, that the um, CNAs and nurses have to use over and over again. Why? It's, it's just stupid. And we've got all this funding coming in from the government, and, and what's it doing? Right. 
you know, I guess, and, and vaccines mm -hmm. and, and forced. You know, if you're a nursing home resident, they expect you to do it and the families are pressured, mm -hmm. not made to, but they're right. pressured. But there's, there's no, they keep using this word, the science, which is crazy. It makes you check your brain at the door. So I'm, I'm just wondering if there's an answer to that. Well, let me speak to this really quickly. I was in Nebraska last week. I've been in several airports over the past week. And thank you for your question and your statement, too. If you read uh, Leviticus 26 or Deuteronomy 28, you see God has assigned blessings and curses for a nation that obeys him or disobeys him. And then he says, hey, if you'll listen, then I'll turn and I will bless. But if you won't listen, then he ratchets up the judgment. He ratchets up the judgment. And you're right, that judgment is not there because he hates us. We don't spake our children because we hate them. It's to teach us, it's to bring us back to him. For I know the thoughts that I think of you, says the Lord. Right, the book of Jeremiah. You know what pastors never do? They never explain that they're in the middle of judgment right there. And the Lord is saying after inflicting a whole lot of judgment on the nation, hey, I know the thoughts that I think of you, says the Lord. Anyways, I'm going to go to this store. Okay, so I'm going through the airports, and what do they say? Uh... <laughs> Uh, according, remember, according to federal law, you, you know, you must wear a, a mask, and if you don't, it's punishable by fine and possible imprisonment. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> What's the problem with that statement? There is no federal law. There's no federal law. I flew into an airport, and then I came back to that airport to fly home, I think this was a month ago, and I got in there, and I was wearing a gaiter or something like that, and I do wear a mask in the airport, not in the airport, but in the plane, because they won't let you into the plane unless you have it, and I just take it off the rest of the time. So I'm going through TSA with a gator, and they're like, oh, you can't wear that. And I was like, what do you mean? I was just here like four days ago. Oh, the, the federal law said this. I said, what? There's no federal law. Oh, yeah, Joe Biden just signed it into law. <laughs> That's an executive order. It's not a law, but I'm not going to argue with you. My goodness. I'm sure you deserve your $12 an hour. Way to go. <laughs> I hope you feel patriotic. You know what? That was wrong. I shouldn't have said that. It was what I was thinking. I'm a sinner, but it is wrong. I shouldn't have said that. And I didn't say it to him either. So anyways, I was like, so what am I supposed to wear, man? He's like, well, here, here's this diaper. Put it on your face. I'm just kidding. They gave me one of those, you know, those, yeah, so. I'm like, okay, whatever, dude. So I go through, me and my son, we go through. I get to the scanner, the body scanner there. And the guy up there is like, you have to wear two of those. And I said, what? <laughs> yeah, I have to have two of those. It's federal law now. I'm like, your comrade just gave me this. And I'm so confusing. There is no law. So when these agencies create CDC, Health Department, blah, 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 that's where, again, state governors can say, uh, not in my state. Florida, not in my state. There's no requirements. Governor first is the governor collapses and folds like a silly person, like Minnesota, tragically Wisconsin. Then the sheriff comes and says, not going to enforce this. This is not law. I didn't swear an oath uh, to defend and uphold the governor's mandates. Do you get what I'm saying? Yes. So then those agencies, so how do we treat those agencies? We put them in their place. And we've got to do that with authority. And we want to do it under authority. So that would be where our sheriff comes into play. Now, here's the deal. Let's say nobody listens. Yes. Nobody listens. Well, then the Christian church is in some, and we're very familiar with this as a Christian church. And I'm not looking forward to this, and I don't celebrate with this. But now we're into persecution. So what does your conscience tell you? And that's where you have to make that definitive decision. And based upon what your conscience tells you, that's before you and God is going to be whether or not the outcome is going to be good or bad for you. But you can't go against conscience. What did Martin Luther say? Going against conscience is neither safe nor right. And he said that before the, the Diet of Worms, when he was going to go to the stake and be burned as a heretic, but yet he still said that. So that is the Christian church. Um, I'm grateful right now. There is no forced vaccines, but don't you feel like we're being conditioned? Like how much are they going to, how much are they going to put up with here? Oh, did you see that, Joel? They did that too. Well, let's do some more, right? And now they're saying, well, you know, in 2022 we get it. I mean, it's, it's, it's really, it's a sad travesty, guys. I want to encourage you in your independent, in your independent living and so on and so forth. Be bold for what Christ has put on your heart. If God has said, don't wear a mask, then don't wear a stinking mask. Honestly. Yes, ma'am. Yes, you can. You should call the sheriff. You should call the sheriff. I would encourage all of you. Get a hold of the sheriff. Oh, yeah, at the airport. That's a good point. Now I'm feeling a little convicted because I don't do that. I pull up my gator. I go through the scanner, and I pull it back down. See, I thought I was being brave, but now clearly you... 
<laughs> you were. You were doing a good job. Doing a good job here. Here's what ends up happening. This is what I do want to make the statement, and this is, a, this is constitutional as well. We've all heard of the Civil Rights Act, right, where, you're, where businesses are forced to. How many of you love to smoke cigarettes? I'm just kidding. Don't raise your hand. That would be embarrassing. <laughs> I don't love to smoke cigarettes. I grew up with a smoking father. I hate cigarettes. But do I believe the government can tell a restaurant that they can't have cigarette smoking in their restaurant? No. The business is not the government's. If a business says, you can't come in our store unless you wear a mask, then either wear a mask or don't go to the business. Can the business owner say that? Yeah, he can. Because if we say that he can't, if we say that he can't, then what we're saying is we can dictate what that business owner can and cannot do with his business. Oh, sorry. Okay, cool. Oh, sure. Okay, go ahead. So, in regards to that. Yeah. Yes. Got it. Right. I had my mask exemption on. Sure. And I actually don't get sick from wearing a mask. Right. But You're not alone. Doctor. Right. So I walk in, and the guy goes, I need my mask. Do you have a mask? And right. I said, no, actually, I have a mask exemption. Don't mind. Yeah. He goes, I'm sorry, you'll have to go outside. And I said, well, I'm just curious about my conscience. I'm not right. Like yeah. Yeah. That if you discriminate for health, mm. race, creed, religion, disability, this is not the insurance that would be enough to cover that. Good for you. To what I would have in the store. Mm. Because when I came out here and helped you get your contacts, mm. it's not equal service. And that is a state law. And right now you are breaking the law. Good for you. Right. Good job. Ready to go. You're absolutely right. I've gone into countless stores without a mask, and the, the employees and the others say, say, thank you. Thank you for your stand. I wear a hat that says, make the Constitution matter again. And I wear my Ronald Reagan shirt, and I walk through airports. I'm a billboard. I want to be a billboard. I went into Byerly's this morning to buy uh, one of our people some flowers. And uh, I went in there, and she said, you're going to have to wear a mask, sir. And I said, well, I'll tell you what. I just want to give you some money. Can I just do that, and then I'll leave? So yeah, these are teaching moments that you can utilize, and way to go. Thanks for bringing Jake. I ran for sheriff in St. Croix County here wow. for the sole purpose to protect the Constitution. Right. There we go. I think there's a calling. I heard the Lord. Yeah. Did you hear that, 2022? I did it once. <laughs> my, my issue has been all along, all along this constitutionality mm -hmm. of laws that aren't laws. Mm -hmm and the enforcement mechanism that people are using against these fake laws. And we have the First Amendment, yeah. but yet we shut down the churches. Right. We have the Second Amendment, right. but we're taking away all of those rights. Mm -hmm. We're doing that incrementally. Mm -hmm. um, get the Fourth Amendment. Yep. We, got, we got cities telling people they can't have a rain barrel. Right. The government owns the rainwater. We mm -hmm. got, we got them telling them, you have to replace the toilet in your house. It's not 3.8 gallons per flush. Um, you have to remove the fireplace in Colorado. We can't have those anymore. Yeah. And so these laws are completely against the Constitution. We're mm -hmm. sitting here talking about this great Constitution, yeah. but everybody is passing laws, and we got the thumb of everybody pushing down on us. Yeah. What is the cure for this unless it's somebody like me running for sheriff? Who else is going to do it? Right. That's, I mean. I think you answered your own question, right? Who else is going to do it? You know, what, what, who was it that said uh, Hudson Taylor? You know, if not me, then who? If not now, then when? You know, so I, I do want to speak to that just really quickly. In the Declaration of Independence, the Founding Fathers were being accused of breaking the law, right? And so he said that, you know, we have been accused by the kings as part of the grievances uh, of, of um, we have been accused of pretended offenses was the word. He, they used pretend. And then they sp spoke about that legislation that the king was, 
and they called it pretended legislation. It's in the Declaration of Independence. So what you're describing is pretend. But that doesn't mean they can't enforce it. It doesn't mean they won't enforce it. And that's the tragedy. So then how does it stop? It only stops when people resist. Generally speaking, there's waves of that resistance. The, the, the silly thing to me is, because I'm a man, you're a man, we're, we're parents. You know, if somebody's attacking our family, it's just naturally in us. We're going to defend them. Mothers, they're going to naturally defend that. But when it comes to constitutional rights, those in office are not naturally defending them. And that's all it would take. We're actually voluntarily giving most of this stuff up, aren't we? Yes. There's not even a fight that's existing. Like sheriffs aren't even saying, well, well you know, then, then this would happen and that's just not worth the fight. That's what they say, right? Because it'll end up getting undone anyway. And that's a cop-out. No man says that when his family's in danger. No woman says that when their family is in danger. They defend and they protect. Our veterans don't say that uh, when they're fighting, do they? No, they don't. So why does government? And that's the age-old question. Well, the people have tolerated to some extent. The people have populated the halls of justice. We've created bureaucrats and, and we've created a system. Both parties are in it together. There's numerous different ways. So what is my calling before God? Yours was to run for sheriff. And I'm sure you reached a lot of people and you've touched a lot of people. Maybe the Lord is calling you to run again. I don't know. My calling right now is I need to make sure that more people know these concepts than just are sitting right here. I want to do that. I hope I'm successful doing that. I want to support you if you run for office. I support sheriffs and legislators. I try to find them throughout the country. I try to back them. I make videos for them so they've got some ammunition to be able to use when they're accused in court or they're accused publicly. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm attempting to do uh, right now. And I would encourage everybody else in here to do that. And thank you for your run. So, sure. so the underlying point of all of this uh -huh. is that we have reached the point where there is no justice because we cannot have our day in court. We cannot go in court without a mask. Do you know that you can't get your case heard without a mask? You can't walk in some courthouses in, in, I think, the district court in Wisconsin. I don't think you can. They have set the rule. The entire uh, Supreme Court system of New York, you can't enter it. You cannot have your case heard. Mm -hmm. I just tried to have a, a case heard in St. Croix County. You can't have your day in court without a mask. Mm -hmm. So it's really coming down to a really bad level. I agree. Anyway, thank you Agreed. for what you do. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I've got time. I've got time for one more because I've got to drive back to Minnesota um, later tonight. Is are, are you? Is, is there anybody else that wanted a question? Because if you do want to, oh, the pastor. Oh, okay. Okay, I got time for two more. <laughs> two more. Okay. Okay. Hi. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, thank you. So I have a uh, no trespassing order against me at Cub Foods for not wearing a mask. The store manager. I told him I can't wear a mask because of Minnesota State Law 609735, sure. that you can't wear a face mask in public. Right, that's true. And that he took that exist. as a threat. And I got a hold of the report, and he said I threatened him, which I didn't. I'm like, you're a grown man. What am I? And if you, I threatened you, why did you follow me through the grocery store? Right? right. So I called my sheriff, Dan Starry, and, yeah. um, and he said, well, peop it wasn't him. It was his uh, secretary, whatever, advisor. Right. Uh, and said, well, people, they have the right to refuse service. Is that true? And would you press the issue with the sheriff some more on that? Yeah, they do have the right to refuse service. So I, I was saying that earlier. I, I liked how you educated. I couldn't Sounds like you've educated as well. And so it's a matter of store policy is what they're saying. So I'm actually shocked they're enforcing it. I, live, I happen to live in North Carolina, but all the big corporations like Walmart, uh, I don't know if Target's on board because they're just weird. Um, but, but Home Depot, Lowe's, they said, look, we're not going to be the enforcers of this stuff because our employees are going to get beat up. Then we're going to have a lawsuit in our hands. So they post 10 million signs. They'll come up to you. You'll notice they'll say, hi, hi, do you need a mask? And you just say no and you keep walking. Now, this is where, 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 they're, where they're dinging you for criminal trespass. Uh, is that what you're saying? Were you given a citation for that or... Oh, okay. That must be an internal uh, policy thing. I don't know. Did he get your driver's license? How did this guy know who you were? Well, he called the police, and the police came out, and I went out to my car. 
I said, I'm not leaving the NASCAR, and I'm going to finish shopping, and then I'm going to yeah. walk to my car. Right. And he called the police. The police showed up. Excuse me, did you threaten somebody? I'm like, no. Right. And, and so then she took my information, and I just told her. I said, well, <laughs> I was shopping, and he asked me to put a mask on, and I said, no, thank you. And okay, so that... So they just gave me a, a no trespassing order from the grocery store. Okay. Well, there's a little bit of complexity into what you're saying. Cause first of all, that officer shouldn't have taken any information from you for that. You weren't required to give that. There was no warrant for that, right? No. And there was no actionable cause. So now you've got the police chief, and, and you said you called the police chief or you called the sheriff? I called the sheriff. Okay, and then the sheriff looked into that for you? No, the sheriff said, the sheriff's secretary said that they have the right to refuse service. Well, then say, I really appreciate you sharing with me that, but I need to talk to the sheriff. I, I, I appreciate you doing a great job, you're a great assistant, but I do need to talk to the sheriff because somebody took my information and I'm scared, I'm, I don't know what they're even doing with it. I don't wanna walk into something blindly. I would, I would play that card with them if you wanna push that. And then I would also maybe get a hold of that police chief who had that police officer that came and did all that and wrote it down and, and what have you. And uh, I definitely wouldn't support Cub Foods. <laughs> But, uh, but, but I also understand, you know, and, and different store managers are different and, and so on. But that would be the route that I would take, personally. Yeah, yeah. I call the police sometimes every week. Hi, I'm going out today. Which bra should I break? <laughs> <laughs> the mask band-aid or the face mask? Wait, you really do that? Yeah, I do. I break all of my everybody. Wait, you call the police and you tell them which law should I break? I ask them, which law should I, I'm going out today, which law should I break? The mask mandate or the, I'm not supposed to wear a face mask in public? Oh, wow. And they tell me I should break the mask mandate. I said, so you want me to commit, a, I think it's a misdemeanor. I said, you want me to commit a misdemeanor over, over a mandate? Oh, said, wow. This is more punishable by law for me, and you're telling me to, to, to break that law, but not to break the mandate. I've never done that, what you're saying. Conceal and carry? Yeah, that is true. Well, thank, thank you for sharing. I'm just going to say that, you know, a lot of our law enforcement people don't have the education. Right. They don't. So they need people that are, you know, some of us are gifted in, like, I right. feel like I'm, I'm, I'm kind of an educator type person. Right. And God's given me lots of patience with ignorant people. Right. And so we need to... Make sure we're talking to our police officers. Send them a postcard. You know, I'm praying for you. And by the way, do you know this right. about the Constitution? That's a great point, Sarah. So. And that comes back to our Christianity. Our objective is to win people. We're not, we're not, we're not going to, we're not going to win anybody by clubbing them. And that's, that's tragically what the media has got us so divisive. We're just clubbing each other. We're punching each other. That's a great point. Thank you, Sarah. Yes, ma'am. Thanks for coming. That was great. My pleasure. And I also want to thank the pianist you noticed. He played Come Thou Fount, right? Yes, I did. I was actually <laughs> humming that when you did it. I'm great. not sure where he went, but thank you. That was great. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, pull it right there. There you go. So I was talking to a person on the left the other day, and I mm -hmm. feel like I should know the answer to this, but I'm just confused. And um, I was talking about the censorship of, you know, Facebook and sure. all these big companies and kicking people off. And mm -hmm. she said, free speech is guaranteed from government censorship. No government censorship is, censorship is going on. The laws of this country have always allowed corporations to do whatever they want with their own property. And you mm -hmm. were just saying that about businesses. Um, and if that's a problem you have, then fine, but has absolutely nothing to do with free speech. And I'm just like, there's something wrong with what she's saying, but I can't figure it out. Right. <laughs> so you're talking about like Facebook and so on. Yeah. So these are platforms that we do use. So I'm going to give you just a, a kind of a surface value because there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of ancillary things that come into play, like regulations and so on. But if Facebook wants to shut down your account, that account is actually not yours. It's Facebook's. They can shut down. That's horrible, isn't it? I hate hearing that. That's horrible. They shouldn't do that. But again, it's not your account. It is Facebook's account. So now it turns into kind of a PR battle. Can we make Facebook look like big, bad, spooky people? We're not really winning at this point. We are amongst ourselves, but the general public, not so much. Um, but going back to speech, okay? So can, can freedom of the press is part of the First Amendment as well. As long as Facebook is not slandering you, um, 
because that is illegal. That's an infraction against the law. Um, or disparaging you or printing lies about you. Then there's no law broken there. Now, some, some of my colleagues and some of my contemporaries may disagree with me. I don't think what they're doing is right. I don't think it's acceptable. I don't think it's good ethical practice. I think it's actually silly and very telling um, on the opposite of that. But the danger always is, if we want to get government to come in to force them to do this, we got to be prepared then. The government might swing the pendulum and force us to do. So that's where it gets kind of dicey there, you know? So, I mean, I don't, I don't personally really look at Facebook much. We use it to promote our message, and we use it to broadcast it, and there's certain things that they censor. They've shut down my personal Facebook account before, too. And um, uh, so, anyhow, I, I hope that answers that question. And listen, if anybody has any other questions, I would love to take them. I've got to take them at the table, though. Um, it really has been a pleasure. Thanks for sticking around so long, guys. And I haven't seen one person fall asleep, and I've been looking, too. So <laughs> thank you very much for staying alive, staying alert. Um, God bless you all. Uh, and, and thank you for all, all that you all do for our republic. It's very encouraging to me to be able to come here and see this. So thank you. Have a great evening. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thanks, Jake. All right, let's stop by his table, too. Can, before everybody leaves, can I say one thing before you all leave? So going on from what Luca said, and if we want to have ways that we can fight this, then what Luca said is a very perfect example because we need to hit them where it counts with these businesses, and that's where they make money. And so every person here should be writing to Cub Foods and saying, we will not support you if this is the way you treat our friend or this person that we know, and spreading that around. And that's the only way we're going to change things. And you write to their, there, write there's a, there's a guy who ran for office that's um, wanting people to join together for a class action suit against Cub Foods, too. So maybe that would be worthwhile connecting with him. I can do that later. So thank you, everybody.